noticed, we have been um, talking on the uh, middleware series. The last last time we heard about Kix and its interaction with COBOL. And today we have Todd Birch um, to talk to us about DB2 and how DB2 works Cobalt with Friday, as you might have noticed, um, how that interacts with COBOL. So Todd, welcome. Thank you for taking your um, time this um, morning, afternoon, actually, almost late after, late morning for you, Todd, um, to spend and share your expertise with us here on COBOL Friday. All right, you're welcome, and thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from Chapel Hill, Texas, and uh, thank you for joining today. I'm looking forward to this session. I, I hope I get questions, um, not because I create confusion, but because you're interested in this subject. So I've been working uh, DB2 uh, for most of my IT career. Uh, I started working with DB2 in 1984, uh, prior to DB2 version one, release one becoming generally available. So I have quite a bit of experience with DB2 under my belt. I will not profess to be in a COBOL expert, um, but assembler or Rex, yes. Uh, so uh, if you come in with some heavy COBOL questions, I have Paul to assist me. So let's get going. I'm gonna talk primarily today about how um, you would code SQL in a COBOL program to access DB2 data. So first I'll cover a, a very high level, extremely high level about what DB2 is. And then I will talk about uh, where the rubber meets the road um, and how to embed SQL in a COBOL program and how to prepare your COBOL program for execution. So DB2 is a relational database management system. Uh, it's been around for a long time, DB2, uh, became GA in April or May, it was, of 1984. And it's gone through a lot of uh, improvements over the last, you know, 30 some odd years. Uh, and it's, it's a really interesting product. It's very complex, uh, but it's in use in probably the Fortune 10,000 companies, if not more. And it's, it's, it's a very good skill to have to add to your COBOL repertoire. Um, so DB2 data can be, can be viewed as tables. Uh, where in this first uh, box up here on the top left, we might have a customer table. Uh, a customer table is made up of rows and columns. And so whenever you manipulate data, you would, you would select uh, from a table and you would select columns from a table and you might qualify which rows you wanna look at. And then you, there'd be multiple tables. There's a customer table, an order table, and an item table here. Uh, I'm gonna have a very simple table in my examples and I call it table one. To access DB2 data, you use the structured query language uh, or SQL. There are three types of SQL. It breaks down into three different categories. There is DML or data manipulation language. And this is the, 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 the language constructs that we use to retrieve data with select, uh, to update data, to insert new data, or to delete existing data. Uh, there's another construct of SQL called DDL or data definition language. And this is how you would create your tables in DB2. So you might say create table or create index or, or drop table space. And uh, it's, it's, it's not something that you would typically use in a transaction environment, uh, but to set up your data and your tables, you would use DDL. And then a very small subset is the DCL or data control language. And this is where you would uh, use grant and revoke statements to permit or, or deny authorization um, to objects and, and different features and functions. Any questions so far? 
Okay, we'll keep going. Um, one thing that's in DB2 that's important to know about is the DB2 catalog. And the, the catalog is where the information about all the user objects and system objects are kept. And so DB2 uses the catalog. You can use the catalog to keep track of, of everything that's defined. So if you use DDL to create a table, uh, a row would be inserted for you in the SysTables table. If you created a view, you would have a row in the SysViews table and so on. So the DB2 catalog is a pretty important thing within DB2. Now, that was my high level of DB2. I, I don't really have time to go much deeper. Uh, and so now we're going to transition over into talking about COBOL and uh, different ways to prepare a COBOL program. When you're going to write a COBOL program that has SQL in it, you're going to have to choose a method to prepare your program. The traditional way, uh, or, or the, the way that's been available since 1984, is to use a component of DB2 called the precompiler. And I'll have a slide on how that works in a second. And uh, the other way, uh, which is the, the, the way that we encourage people to do now is to use the COBOL coprocessor. Uh, the DB2 precompiler runs outside of DB2, and the DB2 precompiler will parse the COBOL program and the SQL. It will replace the SQL statements with COBOL statements, and then the output of the precompiler will be fed into the COBOL compiler. The COBOL coprocessor, however, runs inside the COBOL compiler, and uh, it allows you to better leverage aspects of the COBOL language and, and do um, more complicated things with COBOL uh, that you couldn't do with the precompiler. And it allows you to take up new features of COBOL much sooner. Um, and it's, it's really just a better way to go. And the example that I'll have today uses the COBOL coprocessor. Here's a visual of the program preparation steps that you would use for the compiler. You would start with writing your COBOL program with embedded SQL, and I'll have an example of embedded SQL in a couple minutes. You would then send that through the DB2 precompiler. The DB2 precompiler is gonna have two outputs. Uh, the first output is gonna be the modified source. And so this is your COBOL program with your SQL and the SQL turned into host COBOL statements. Uh, once, uh, at, at this point, you just send this to the standard compiler. Uh, it produces the object deck. You would link edit it. And then that will produce a load module that you can execute. So everything on this left-hand side, if you're writing COBOL programs today, uh, is, is something that you're familiar with. The other output of the DB2 precompiler is a, a DBRM, and a, and a DBRM stands for Database Request Module. And this is uh, where the DB2 precompiler has sucked out all the SQL statements that you have in your program and written them into a format, uh, into 80-byte records that is stored in this DBRM. This DBRM is then used in another DB2 process called bind. And the first thing you would do is you would bind a package. The output of bind package goes in the DB2 catalog tables. Uh, and then you would use bind plan, another DB2 facility that would read those packages and it would create uh, some more information in other DB2 catalog tables called a plan. And so the things that tie together is when the load module runs, the load module says, hey, DB2, I want to run this plan. And so between the association between the load module and the plan is how things are run. So all this plan information is stored in DB2 and it's used only by DB2. When this load module makes a call to DB2, this plan tells DB2 what SQL statements that need to be executed.
With the coprocessor, the program prep steps are a little bit different. They're simpler. You start with a COBOL source program with embedded SQL, and then you compile that uh, with the option that says that there's SQL in it. The output of the compiler is twofold. The first thing is the object deck, which you could then link edit and have a load module. The other output is a DBRM, which is the same thing that the precompiler generates. And then that precompiler is used in, I'm sorry, the DBRM is used in the same way that it was used with the DB2 precompiler, where you bind a package and then you bind a plan from that package, which produces the plan, which allows your load module when it executes uh, to communicate with DB2 and DB2 knows what it is that you're trying to execute. So I've associated these different steps with a blue outline for the compile process that I'll be explaining. And then later on, we'll see this graphic. Uh, we'll see ex exactly the, the, J the JCL and the statements that are used for this process to happen in red. Any questions? There is one, Todd. Okay. Um, I think it was earlier on when you were talking about DB2. So the question, and I'm going to read it as is, is for data and access control, what kind of privileges are required for granting and removing permissions? Okay, so this there's a long answer to that. Uh, it, it starts out with uh, the person who installed DB2. You, you have this person called the sysadm or system administrator. And so there's a sysadm privilege uh, that uh, in, in, in basic terms can pretty much do anything in DB2. It can, it can stop DB2. It can, it can grant anything. It could revoke anything. Um, but then as, as the hierarchy of, of data access trickles down, uh, there are other authorities. There's, there's not just system administrator, but there's database administrator. Uh, there's database control access. Uh, security in DB2 is, is fairly complicated now. Uh, but one of the things you can remember is if, is if you have authority uh, to, uh, for instance, a, a database administrator authority for a given database and all the objects within that database, uh, you can create things, you can, you can drop things. Uh, anything that you create, you have access to as far as read and write access. If somebody else created the table, they would probably have to grant you access uh, unless your system has been set up uh, with rules uh, and groups uh, that will allow easier administration of uh, data access. So it's, it's a very big topic. Um, but the essential, the thing is, it's, it's a hierarchy and it starts out with, you know, the sysadm and then as when DB2 is installed and configure, the system administrators and DBA or the uh, database administrators would then would divvy out whatever authorities uh, that you might need. As, as a developer, a COBOL developer, maybe on a test system, uh, you would probably have a pretty high privilege uh, because you would want to be able to do things unrestricted. And uh, but moving over to a production environment, uh, things would probably be a lot tighter controlled and you might just have access to your data. Uh, that sounds that and, makes sense. Thank and you. This is, Paul, this is Paul, if I can make one comment about that, just to let you know, for those of you that are listening and you're thinking about the OMP COBOL system, I have to treat it like production because I don't want you guys to accidentally hurt each other because too much authority can create problems for everyone. So just let you know what, what Todd was saying is so true, but I have to treat it like production. I can't treat it like development because you can harm each other. That was the only comment I wanted yeah. to add oh, to the group. Thank you, Paul. That makes, that makes sense, yeah. Um, so Todd, there is one other question. Um, okay. Todd? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm trying to uh, share my screen. Okay, yes. Oops, I think, Todd, are you there? I think we lost him. Yeah, we did. And uh, so there isn't, there is a couple other questions out there while we're getting um, Todd to rejoin. Yeah. Um, 
there was one person, is there an easy to use free sandbox for SQL and DB2? Well, as you know, um, SQL is just the language of relational databases. And so specifically, if you're talking about DB2, there actually are some what's called community editions of DB2 that you can run in Linux, Unix, Windows, which means on your workstation. Uh, now, we do have the OMP COBOL project. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a lab system, but we haven't officially made DB2 available yet on ZOS. But in terms of are there easy to use free sandbox for SQL and DB2, um, there is what's called a community edition, and we call it DB2 for Linux, Unix, Windows, LUW. And um, that's a good way to kind of learn a little bit about relational database and SQL, because once you learn about SQL, it applies to all relational databases. DB2 just happens to be IBM's. And then I think my SQL from Oracle has been around for quite a while too. And my SQL was a community edition uh, release for a while. And they were standalone until Oracle acquired them. So hopefully that, that answers that question. Is there an easy to use free sandbox for SQL and DB2? Thank you, Paul. I was just gonna slack you about that question. Yeah. <laughs> and let me see if there's anything on the... On the YouTube? Yeah, I'm checking that right now. Okay, thank you. Nothing on YouTube at the moment. Okay. Oh yeah, it looks like the person asked the question just said thank you, so hopefully that answers it. Mm -hmm. There was another person out there that did post something about beginner SQL tutorial. I've never looked at that myself for grant and revoke privileges uh, to one of the comments yeah. about exactly. security. All relational databases, just to let you know, one of the principles of any relational database is, is internal security. So no matter which relational database, they have internal security. And as Todd mentioned early on, there is a category of SQL called DCL, data control language. That's where the grant and revokes all live. And we okay, have can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. We see you. We okay. All right, I'm going to turn this camera off and go back to share mode. Apologize for that. Is the share screen working, Todd, for you now? No, it's it's, it's spinning again. Okay. I, I noticed your camera's still on, Todd. I wonder if you turn camera off. Yeah. Um. Do you want to email? I'm clicking it. Yeah, Um. as one... Okay. There we go. It's working. It's changed. Well, the, right. the camera has turned off. So. Sorry, everybody. This is well, embarrassing. I was able to answer a few questions, uh, Todd, while you were. Yeah, oh, very good. Thank you. It, it, the good news is the system's reacting to you just slowly. Yes. Okay. Well, um, so. Todd, did you want to share your presentation perhaps by email with me and I can see if I could share my screen and you can talk to it? Oh, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. Let me do that. Yeah. So we can, yeah, only though um, when you want to do the demo, you would still need to share your screen though, right? So, oops. Yeah, we'll just take one step at a time. Yeah. There was one comment while um, while Todd's getting that over to Sudarshna. There was a very good comment in the chat line. IBM has a Docker container for DB2 that I've used in the past. And the person put a, um, mm -hmm. put a URL there. And that's kind of fascinating to me. I never really realized that. Um, everything's getting containerized these days. So I may go check that Docker uh, container. So thank you, David, for that comment. 
Yeah, and while I'm waiting for getting the email to share the presentation for Todd, um, another new development in the DB2 space is there is now a VS Code extension for SQL. Um, so that's that's new, and I think I saw an article about that on LinkedIn. So if any of you want to give that a try, um, and you're comfortable and are used to VS Code, and as you all know, for the COBOL programming course, we um, leverage that same tooling, VS Code, with the Zoe and Z Open Editor extensions. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as well as a brand new offering an extension on VS Code. Yeah, that was an excellent comment, Sadarshna. And just to let you know, we had we see within IBM we see a lot of people that want to modernize their applications. The mainframe doesn't need modernization; it's already there. It's very modern. But what needs to be done is application modernization. And some of these new DevOps and DevSecOps tooling, it, uh, they're maturing very rapidly. And the, the Zoe platform is an, is an open source framework that many vendors, including IBM, are adding things to. So the, the, the application modernization does include cultural changes for adopting the DevOps tools that are now just maturing. They're getting better and better. All right. Okay, can you see my screen now? No, we don't. But I, I just got your um, deck, okay. Todd, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, do you see my screen now? Yes, and I'm thank going you. to go to this slide, or no, we were down here. This is the right slide. Uh, yeah, keep going. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I had started talking quite a bit about the dynamic SQL versus static SQL. I'm not sure how much you heard, but it's probably best to move on. Um, and then if there's questions I could answer later after this, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, Paul, since I'm in full slideshow mode, I'm unable to see the chat. Can you also look for questions on Crowdcast, please, we'll, for me? We'll, we'll do. Thank you. Okay, let, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so to compile a, a program and process the SQL, only three things that you need to do. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is uh, you can see on that first graphic, line 10 is, is, is the prefix area is in red. Uh, you have to add the SQL parameter uh, when you call the COBOL compiler. So palm equals SQL, and then that will tell the compiler uh, that uh, it will be calling DB2 uh, during the compile process. The second thing that you need to do is you need to add a DD card uh, pointing uh, the COBOL compiler to the PDS where the DBRM will be kept. And so on the second graphic, line 28 is in red, and you can see the DBRM live DD card, and that just points to a member of a PDS. And then the third thing that you need to do is just add SQL to your program. And that can come in so many different ways in formats. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So when you when you add SQL to your COBOL program, you have to delineate it uh, to COBOL where your SQL starts and where your SQL ends. And that's done with a couple phrases. The first one is exec SQL and then you will add whatever SQL statement that you had, and then you would end it with an end exec. Uh, so a simple example uh, would be exec SQL, open a cursor, uh, end exec. And, and just, uh, if you don't know what a cursor is, when, when you retrieve rows from DB2, you retrieve uh, the rows from a table uh, using a cursor. And this is just like if you held your cursor uh, on a table in, in 
a word processor and then you select that row, you move your cursor down to the next row and you select that row. So, so there's a concept of current row that the cursor points at. And so when you select, uh, you use that cursor to tell DB2 uh, which row you're interested in. Next slide. So here's an image of uh, a COBOL program. This is a fairly small COBOL program. Uh, but what I wanted to show you uh, in this particular slide is the data division in the working storage section. Uh, here you can see that at the 01 and 05 levels, we have some host variables defined. Uh, and then we have a comment that says DB2 decal gens or cursors. Uh, a decal gen is short for declarations generator. And this is where uh, you could define the layout of your DB2 table in COBOL terms. And so that would be a decal gen, is, is the COBOL statements that would reflect uh, the structure of your DB2 table. We also see in that exec SQL include uh, a couple include statements, and the second one's commented out. The first one is required in every SQL, uh, every COBOL program you have SQL in, and, and you include the SQLCA. SQLCA stands for SQL Communications Area. And this is where DB2 will report the success or failure of the SQL statement that was issued. The failure might be a syntax error. The failure might be a resource unavailable. Uh, maybe, you know, somebody has stopped the table that you wanted to select from. Uh, and so it's, it's very important to look at the SQLCA after an SQL statement. And the most important field in the SQLCA is the SQL code. Uh, and that's either a positive or a negative value that, that tells you the success. Uh, then we have an exec SQL on line 50, uh, which is a declare cursor. So we have a declare CS1 cursor, and CS1 is an arbitrary name uh, that the programmer has chosen. And then we're declaring a cursor for a select statement. And in this case, we're going to select uh, three columns, the name column, the serial column, and the phone column from table one. And then I have commented out a where clause. And a where clause is part of SQL where you can qualify rows. Um, and if we have time, I'll show you that, uh, how that works in a little bit. And then that's the end of, of the exec. Um, I'm getting a little bit of static feedback. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, for me, Todd, it's generally okay. I think if you talk a little bit slower, it won't be as bad but it's it's okay let me let me go on mute as well okay that seems to have fixed it okay i'm ready for the next slide or questions if there's any questions thank you daniel for the feedback okay all right so this is the procedure division and it's a very small procedure and it, it doesn't do much uh, in terms of COBOL, but it does a lot behind the scenes uh, as, as far as DB2 goes. So the first statement that we have is, well, back in the, uh, the, the work and storage section, we declared the cursor, uh, cursor one, CS1. And now in the executable code, we're going to actually open that cursor. And open uh, makes a call to DB2. DB2 will then load uh, what used to be your DBRM, but what is now your package and your plan. And DB2 will create all the internal structures that are going to be necessary to, to satisfy request uh, for data from your table uh, identified by that cursor. Open will return uh, the SQL code in the SQL CA. I'll show you what that looks like in a, in a listing in a little bit. And uh, so we move the SQL code to an output uh, format, uh, and then we display the SQL code. If it is a negative SQL code, we might want to see some tokens, and that's what the display SQL ERM 
does. Uh, there's a more advanced way uh, to do this, but for the purpose of today, I'm just showing you the, the basics here. And then we have a perform loop. Uh, while the SQL code is not equal to zero, and, and perform until SQL code is not equal to zero. And the, the SQL statement that we're going to issue in this loop is fetch. And so fetch will make calls to DB2 to get the next row that's pointed to by the cursor, and, and DB2 keeps that pointer uh, where the cursor is internally, so you don't have to remember it in your program. And so uh, we selected the name, the serial, and the phone columns in our select statement, but we're gonna, we're gonna fetch those into H name, H serial, and H phone in the COBOL program. And so DB2 is gonna do uh, a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen. He'll do data conversions, he'll do all kinds of things uh, to get that data back into your program so your program can use it. If the SQL code was zero, if that fetch worked successfully, uh, if there were rows to be returned, uh, then we just do a simple display of the name, the serial number, and the phone number. And then once the SQL code does not equal zero anymore, and it's most likely gonna equal a plus 100, which means no more rows were available in the cursor to fetch, uh, the loop will exit, and then uh, as a good citizen, we will close the cursor uh, and then the program ends. So it's a pretty basic program. We open cursor, we fetch, 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 and then we close the cursor. Uh, we can go to the next slide and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Okay, the link edit step uh, is a little bit special for COBOL programs when they contain embedded SQL. Uh, and they're special because uh, your COBOL program has to know, uh, has to have a way to connect to DB2 at runtime. And so there are different, what, what DB2 calls attachment facilities uh, that are available to use. There's a, a TSO attach, which is what we're using here. We're gonna run our COB2 DB2 program under TSO batch. And so we're including the TSO version of the attachment on line 109 that says include syslib DSN ELI. And everything else about the link edit is standard typical stuff other than, you know, the DD names pointing to the DB2 load libraries uh, and the include statement for the link edit. If you were to try to link edit your program without that include, you'd have link edit failures because DB, uh, the COBOL program will be calling uh, DB2 modules. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so before I showed you that red box uh, that was part of the program preparation process uh, to do a bind package and a bind plan uh, to make your program known to DB2, and, and these are the statements uh, that you would use to do that. And I'll, I'll take a minute or two to go over what this is. So we have the, we're, we're ru just running batch TSO under IKJFT01. Uh, we're step libing to the DB2 load library and the LE load library. Uh, we're gonna have to point to our DBRM PDS because the input to bind package is a DBRM. Uh, this DSN system, SSTR, uh, this DSN uh, starts what's called the DSN subcommand processor within TSO. And so this DSN command tells TSO that any subsequent commands except the end statement you see like on one, line 139, every statement uh, that's issued after the DSN system command will be a command for DB2. So, so TSO passes these commands over to DB2 and, uh, or, or over to DB2 modules, I should say, and then the bind is processed. And so the first statement we're doing is a bind package and we're putting uh, the built package in this collection called my collection ID. The input member is the highlighted member on line 124, and that is the name of our DBRM that was created 
as part of the compile process. All these other keywords, uh, action, current degree, degree, keep dynamic, and so on, are, are options for how you can define uh, different operating behavior that you want to occur for your program. Uh, some of the popular ones would be isolation on line 134. If you want cursor stability or repeatable read or um, uh, there's a couple other different isolations that you can specify. You want to say who is the qualifier for your tables. And in this case, you know, if you, re if you, if you reference table one, uh, then this qualifier command says that the sysadm is the owner of that table one. Uh, table and that's my ID and so that's why I picked that qualifier uh, since I specified an unqualified table name in the select statement. Uh, degree is for parallelism so there's there's all kinds of different things and options that, that you can specify for bind package. Uh, once the bind package completes uh, we're going to do issue the bind plan and we're calling the plan name the same as our package name which is same as our program name and it, it makes editing uh, JCL really easy because you can start a whole new thing just by doing a global change and so they don't have to be the same I typically make them the same when we bind this plan we're going to pull in the collections uh, that we need to make up this plan and so we give it a PK list uh, uh, keyword on line 144 and we're just saying hey any package uh, that has a collection ID of my collect ID uh, then it's going to be used as input uh, to that bind plan. And so that's pretty much the program preparation process on the DB2 side of things um, uh, for bind package and bind plan. Both of these commands uh, create a ton of information that's placed in DB2 catalog tables. Uh, the DB2 optimizer, if you've heard of, of that thing, is, is, is used during all this process to figure out which access path is going to be used when that SQL statement is finally issued or is ever issued uh, from that program. So there's a comment here, the plan is effectively a search path for packages. That's correct. Uh, thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, next question or next slide. Okay, so we've compiled we have link edited, we have done the binds in DB2, and now we are ready to execute it. So we're just gonna run batch TSO. Uh, in batch TSO, we're gonna give it the appropriate step lives, step lives. And uh, we run the DSN command processor, and then now we use the run command. And so we're gonna say, hey, DB2 kickoff program, cob to DB2, and the plan name is also cob to DB2, and then that program will be executed. I see a question from Wendell. Uh, does my collect ID have to be different for each package? Uh, no. Uh, you might want to write three COBOL SQL programs and have all three of those programs uh, in one collection. And that makes binding your plan a lot easier because you can just pull in the collection and that collection will consist of all three packages. Uh, the only thing that is a one-for-one -one relationship would be bind package, and, and the input to that package is just one member. You can't use two different PDS members in one bind package. So, so you can have many packages in a collection. Any other questions? Okay. Um, this is the time that I'm going to try to share again. Uh, do you need to stop sharing before I share? I think so. Let, let me stop right. sharing and let's see if that helps. Are you able to try okay. now, Todd? I've, I've said, all right, it's going through the process. I'm going to share my entire screen. I'm going to say allow. Okay, so can you all see my screen? Yay, success, we do. <laughs> okay, all right, awesome. So what I'm going to get into now is this is the same program uh, that we just went through. Um, and, and I'm going to run this program 
and then we'll look at the output and then we'll make some changes. And so uh, the first thing I'm going to illustrate is a, a bad SQL code. And so, so what I've done here is when this open cursor statement is executed, my table won't exist. And so DB2 will give me a bad SQL code. And so I'm going to submit this. I'm on VM and I'm punching this over to MDS. It's running on MDS and then the output is coming back to me in my VM reader. And that ding says it's back. And so I'm going to look at this line of output, and it says that there is an SQL code from the open as minus 204. And if I took the time to go into the DB2 messages manual to look up SQL code minus 204, it would say the table that you reference does not exist. And the table name that we can see from this other SQL CA field, the SQL ERM field, is that the table name that was not found was sysadam, which is my qualifier, dot table one. So I know that I need to go create that table. I'm going to now go to another system, uh, my MVS system where this is running, and I'm going to uh, give you a quick demo of a facility that DB2 provides called DB2i. It stands for DB2 Interactive and it allows you to do several things. And one of the things that's very popular is this option number one, which is spoofy, and that's called SQL processor using file input. And so I've prepared a member uh, in spoofy that will create my table that I need. I'm gonna make a couple comments here. And so I'm gonna create a table, and it's gonna have three columns, name, serial, and phone. The name is a char 15, the serial is an integer, and the phone is also a char 15. And then I'm going to insert three rows into this table. And uh, the first one who recognizes these names in chat gets an attaboy. So I'm going to submit this. And the output of that says the SQL code was zero for the create table, the commit, and the inserts. So that works. So now we have a table. Do we have a winner yet? No, not yet. Okay, no, we, we don't, don't have I a winner. Gonna, I was going to say, is that from okay. the IVP uh, table that comes with DB2, like the V phone? or? No, it's just a ah, table it, I that's created. The, okay, I was making it more complicated. Okay, all right. So, so I ran my program before. I got a minus 204 because my table didn't exist. I'm going to submit my, my program again. And when it dings, it's back. And we'll go look at the output. And this is my output. Oops, hit the wrong key, sorry. Okay, so now you can see that I got an SQL code uh, from the open that was zero. There were no tokens because there was no error. And, and now we see the three rows that I had created in my table. We have Hank Schrader, Jesse Pinkman, and Walter White, and their serial numbers and their phone numbers. And uh, so we have a very yeah, simple no, COBOL program. Um, someone on YouTube... Someone said we um, have a winner. on YouTube said breaking bad character. Absolutely, very good. My wife and I just watched this. We're a little bit late, but we did see it in this pretty cool series. All right. So so that is our basic. We just did a select and we but but now let's say that we have a COBOL program uh, requirement where we need uh, we need only to get people's names that have a T in them for whatever reason in our application logic. And so we're gonna go back and change our SQL statement and we're gonna comment out or uh, uncomment this where clause. And so the where clause says where name, this is column name in DB2, like percent T percent, and that means there's any letter T 
in a, the name, then we're going to only want to look at those rows. And so we're going to resubmit this now. Clean down just a tad here. And if we go down and look at our, our, our latest output, we can see that only Walter White had a T in his name, and so the other data was excluded. So, so this is nice. If, if you've written a COBOL program to go through a vSAM file of data, some copy book, to look for specific records, uh, DB2 does all that for you uh, via the SQL language. It's very powerful. Um, I work in, um, in DB2 support, uh, within IBM and, uh, I mean, we get, we, we see what people are doing every day and, and, and SQL, the SQL language, SQL statements can be up to two megabytes long. I mean, it's ridiculous how complex some of these SQL statements can be, but it's a whole lot cheaper for a, a person or a company to use SQL and let DB2 do the grunt work uh, than it is to have to write COBOL code to do all this filtering yourself. So, so DB2, um, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, when, when people first started using computers, uh, the, the, the big pain point was the application backlog. And, and that's still a pain point today, uh, but it's, it's products like DB2 uh, that can help reduce the application backlog by taking application logic out of the application that you're writing and, and keeping it within the database management system and letting the database management system that's, that's highly tuned and highly optimized to do these types of things for you. So that's my demo. I wanted to show all of that. It's, 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 it's a fairly basic thing. Uh, as far as what I showed you today, things can get a lot more complicated, but I would encourage you to experiment with, with SQL in your COBOL programs. Uh, if you want to try to just learn SQL, uh, perhaps you have access to DB2i and Spoofy, where you can just start typing some simple SQL and create some tables and do some inserts. And uh, it's, it's, really, it's really fun to use. I mean, it, it literally is fun. I enjoy working with DB2. I've devoted my career to DB2 since 1984. And uh, it's a great product, and it's it's it just blows my mind the things that it can do. Any it's questions? So, be, well, there's no questions on YouTube, and I don't see any on um, at the moment. I don't see any on the uh, Crowdcast. But I put a comment out there, and this happens a lot, Todd. Some people say, "Well, my compile worked just fine. Why can't I get to my DB2 resources?" And I, I put a chat out there that the way I see it is. COBOL knows nothing about those DB2 resources until you go to execute. Would you say that's true or do you have any comments about that? That's correct. Yeah, that's absolutely true. COBOL is just making external calls. Uh, I mean, internally, there's a call statement generated to some DB2 module. That DB2 module gets control, verifies several things, does a PC instruction, does a cross memory call from the COBOL address space, uh, wherever the COBOL address space is running, it might be IMS, might be CICS, might be you know just plain old batch, uh, into the DB2 address space, and then things start really you know gearing up and happening. And so, so the SQL CA is is the only way that COBOL is really going to know that anything's going on with DB2. I mean, that SQL code might say DB2 is not up and running. Uh, the SQL code might you know say hey you know you know, plus 100, no more rows, or, or the, you know, some column you selected was truncated because you didn't give me a host variable long enough to hold it, or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, COBOL doesn't know anything about DB2, uh, doesn't have a clue what DB2 is, uh, and so when, when, when things aren't working in DB2 as they're supposed to, uh, then, you know, the SQL CA is used 
uh, you know, that input output parameter, SQLCA, uh, to communicate back to the COBOL program what's going on. But as far as COBOL language itself, it doesn't so have a clue. Have what a question is. out there. Obviously, I think this must from Rod. This must be a pro because he said any limitations from within an IMS MPP, which is a message processing region where the I am, you know, I'm, I assume what they're talking about is the IMS MPP talking to DB2. So I'm not an expert in IMS uh, as far as any limitations. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are restrictions as far as how many DB2s you can connect to at once. There, there are, you know, system limitations on the number of connections from an MPP. But as far as uh, I, I'd have to have a, a more uh, focused question in order to really, you know, tell you anything else. Um, I mean, there's a lot of limits in DB2. I, I, yeah. That's all I can really say. I did want to. I, I did want to show you uh, in this listing the SQL CA structure that's used. Uh, uh, that's defined, and so you know, I said the most important field was the SQL code, uh, and that's defined. But these are the other fields that come in the SQL CA. SQL state is popular. Uh, that's SQL state is a, a cross platform uh, code. So if you get a SQL state of 010028 on DB2, then that 01028 should be the same on Oracle uh, or on Access or, or whatever. It's, it's like a cross industry standard uh, for error codes. And so some people use SQL state. We primarily work with SQL code. Um, uh, the SQL warn fields W A R N one through E. Uh, if there are any warnings with your SQL statement, uh, then uh, those will be reflected with codes in those fields that your program will need to look at. Um, the SQL E R R D is an array of words that might have information in it uh, that's useful for diagnostics if something's not working correctly. So there's a there's a lot of information in this SQL CA. Uh, and, and any time that you would need to, let's say that you write a COBOL program, you're getting an SQL code back from DB2, a negative SQL code indicates an error, a positive SQL code represents a warning and the warning may be okay or, or maybe something that needs to be addressed. Uh, so anytime you're working with your support staff that works DB2 with an issue with a negative SQL code, uh, you'd want to give them the full SQL CA contents uh, so that the proper diagnosis can be done. That's very important uh, in, in the job that I do. A couple more questions are in there that I think are very good. One is, are SQL DA structures just for dynamic SQL? Uh, the answer to that is yes. The SQL DA is used when you code dynamic SQL. Uh, dynamic SQL uh, has to be passed in host variables. Uh, so instead of doing a declare cursor with your SQL statement, uh, you would do an SQL prepare passing the address or passing a host variable with that dynamic SQL statement. And so the SQL DA isn't, isn't a carrier of error information. Uh, but it's a carrier of uh, information that describes the SQL statement, that describes the host variables, and it describes the result table uh, that DB2 is going to produce uh, when you get ready to fetch your data. So it's another communications area, uh, SQL DA, descriptor area. Yeah, so we have one good question from the YouTube, but we may not have time to really get into it because it's more of a skills thing. I'll just literally read it. Can you tell how to use alter in Spoofy to add primary key in an existing table? But as you, so I'll let you just address that. As you know, we may not have time to educate a person on how to alter a structure. Well, the question was, do I know how to do it? And yes, I know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> good, good point. <laughs> the, uh, you, I, would refer, I would refer them to the SQL reference uh, manual for alter. Uh, and so the syntax is essentially, you know, alter, uh, oh, alter primary key, alter primary key. Primary keys are special. So you, you do a, 
You know, I'd have to look in the book. Uh, I don't I don't know about altering primary keys. There are some things that you can change quite easily in DB2 and other things you can't. So you have to kind of drop and recreate. Right. So I would have to uh, I'd have to get into the meeting. Yeah, and, that. and that's the way I interpret it, too. It's kind of like I would need to understand the structure itself to even get into the alter. Yeah, a primary key is is uh, for those that don't know, is it's it's a it's an induct an index construct uh, for uh, better access to data. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so, uh, Paul, any other questions on YouTube right now? Or was that the last one? I think that was the last one. A couple of very okay. interesting comments that are out there where people are sharing information. Oh, and then I will mention that one person said, I went to school to learn OOP. But when I got my latest job, I had to learn COBOL with DB2. Ends up, I kind of like it. So, awesome. interesting comment. Oh. Yes, that made awesome. our Friday. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to address Rod's question. Um, great question about, uh, you know, IMS. And I just wanted to throw it out there that our next COBOL Friday, which is going to be two weeks from today on August 21st, will be on IMS and its interaction with COBOL. So make sure um, you tune in and, um, you know, listen to that session as well. I just wanted to once again take a moment and thank Todd. Um, Todd, thank you so much and really appreciate your patience. I know there were some technical glitches, so we really appreciate you hanging in there and um, being with us this morning, sharing your expertise on DB2. Well, this was this was very um, helpful and educational. So thank you, Todd. Thank you, Paul. Well, Thank you Absolutely. for having me. Absolutely, a pleasure. And thank you, Paul, for you know taking a few questions and keeping our uh, participants and audience engaged while we were trying to solve our technical issues. Yeah. Um, and thank you are you. always thank you again. support, support for this webinar series. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning, afternoon, evening. Um, have a wonderful rest of your Friday and see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye.